Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so yes, I'm Will Beckett. I, uh, I'm on the business development team at NetEase. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. It's good to see so much, uh, not just history in the room, but so much uh, increasing potential, and it's, uh, it's very cool to be here. Um, yes, uh, before I spend the next 10 minutes or so just going quickly over the Chinese market and what it's like and how you can possibly get in there or some considerations for when you do, uh, let's think about netties. I'm really considering reconsidering the uh, colour scheme here, that's not good. Um, so it was founded in 1997, it was initially an internet company and it was very much part of the uh, infrastructure and in getting internet into China. Um, it has 10,000 plus employees, it's quite large, it's got a very high market cap um, and it's got a number of key areas of business including email, it's the country's largest, I say the country, it's China's largest email provider, uh, 840 million users I think. Um, it's got a portal which has hundreds of millions of users every day. It produces a lot of apps, that includes dictionary apps and social media apps. Um, and it has an e-commerce platform, and of course it works in game development and publishing, um, which is actually the core of what it does now. It's about 75 to 80% of our revenue. Um, some things you may not know us for at all, because they haven't really come outside of China yet, but uh, uh, the first two there are Final, uh, not Final Fantasy, Fantasy Westward Journey and Westward Journey Online. Uh, they're very big, sort of uh, dominating the iOS charts in China since they came out last year. We also operate all of the Blizzard titles within China on mobile and PC, so that includes Hearthstone, uh, Starcraft, World of Warcraft, etc. We also license games, and that includes IPs, so there's Kung Fu Panda 3, which for obvious reasons went down pretty well in China. Um, and what we're very much looking forward to is games like Minecraft, which we are going to be publishing officially in China and uh, one of the first titles for Google Daydream, which is called Twilight Pioneers. But enough about us. The Chinese market, which, uh, yes, may, depressingly, I think, uh, become more prevalent uh, in, depending on what happens with Europe, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, because China, uh, they did actually say, as the results were coming, and I was sort of slowly sinking at my desk, there was a radio report from Xi Jinping saying, we will support Great Britain, whatever the outcome. Thanks, Xi Jinping. Cool, good to know. Um, so it's a very big market. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Uh, it's still, at the moment, mostly made up of uh, non-mobile, so that's PC and 0.02% console. Uh, but the mobile is rapidly gaining ground. Uh, it's it's a, an increasingly large space, and within the next few years, we, we think that that's actually going to dominate the market. I say we, that's a number of analysts um, the genres are beginning to change, so this uh, little little graph here is about the mobile industry. Uh, in the last year or so, we've seen a significant rise in RPG and strategy titles, um, and this is in the production of them. So that, uh, as, as the mobile market grew, as we see in the last slide, and as it continues to grow, we're seeing a lot of PC players migrate away from PC, uh, because it's a little bit cheaper and easier to be on mobile. So as they're a more hardcore section, uh, they're accommodated by an increase in RPGs, as we can see. That's not to say that casual is at all dying in China. It's still a huge uh, section of the market, which, uh, which has hundreds of millions of players every day. Um, it is slowing, along with the Chinese economy, but the, uh, but the games uh, market is still on the rise. Uh, however, because of a lot of competition, um, and a certain number of huge uh, companies that have sprung up, uh, one of ours is that too. Uh, the top 10 grossing ten games take more than half of the revenues. Now, again, uh, I don't want this to seem like too much of a negative because there's still hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to be made outside of that top 10 and indeed outside of that top 100. It's a huge market. Um, another one of the uh, differences is just the number of outlets you have. Over here we tend to worry more just about Google Play or the iOS App Store. Uh, iOS App Store does exist over there, but it's constantly in competition with a huge number of jailbroken app stores. Uh, thanks, guys. And also Android has literally hundreds of channels. There's over 200 Android channels, and some of those carry quite large differences as to what kind of package your game needs to be. Um, and of course, they take their cut as well. The Android channels can take quite a big cut, 30 to 60% sometimes, yeah, which is pretty brutal. 
Um, uh, of course, there are ways around this. Having a partner is one, but we'll come on to that later. Partnerships. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that can be quite harsh. Uh, now, I just want to point out at this point, because we're, we're going to keep looking at a couple of little differences, that, that these, are, these are differences. They're not negatives. So I don't want to present this as something that is you know, unattainable because of all of these harsh aspects of the market. They're just, it just needs to be done in a slightly different way, that's all. So, some considerations. Uh, what do you want to do in order to get into the Chinese market? Do you, do you just want to test the waters? Do you want to put your game and let it float and see what happens and test your success? Uh, is China one part of a large global puzzle for you? Is it happening at the same time as a global launch? Um, and uh, once again, you just want to sort of see how, it do, how your game does. Or do you, in fact, want to go head on, dominate, and compete with everyone else in there? And that's going to take time and money and commitment. So we'll see. Uh, so here are a few of the choices. Uh, there's always going to be a plan B with all of this. Don't get me wrong. These are, these are not the only options you will ever have. You could be better. And that said, compete head on. Find funding. Uh, get some support within the country. And really dedicate a lot of time and money uh, uh, to putting something on the market. And for the smaller startups out of you out there, um, that involves perhaps coming up with a product and finding the support in, inside the Chinese market um, that will let you do that. Uh, or you could be modest. Bear in mind the fact that you might not enter the top 100, and there's nothing wrong with the fact that you might not enter the top 100. As I, again, as I said, there's money to be made, and there's a lot of experience to be had. Or indeed, be surprising, and do something completely different, because there is room for that. Uh, games such as Limbo and Monument Valley uh, despite having a pricing structure that is pretty alien to the Chinese market, that's the premium structure, and, and uh, a level of gameplay and a UI that doesn't look as though a Chinese dictionary has been sitting on it, actually did quite well. Um, and uh, once again, you'll need to ask the creators of for actual metrics, I would never know that. Um, but they retained a good position in the charts. So there is room for this kind of approach if you're able to come up with something that's really creative and wow people uh, aesthetically quite quickly in the way that it wowed all of us in the West too. Otherwise, outside of that, in order to see proper dominant success, there are certain must-haves. Now, these are the must-haves that fall in line with what are currently uh, uh, very successful elements of the Chinese market. But it's a suitable art style. Nothing too grimy or gritty, no sort of space marines. They want to be able to have huge eyes in huge heads uh, they call it Q-type, uh, which is how that's been translated. Um, and uh, they would rather have something uh, with bright colours, uh, uh, something that makes you want to pick up and play and have a nice day. Um, Free-to-play. Free-to-play is very much ingrained within the Chinese psyche. Uh, people are slightly mystified even uh, by the premium pricing structure, although, as I said, it can work sometimes if you do it the right way. Um, that also applies to the actual monetization model and what you want to put money on, want to make players buy. Buying time doesn't really work within the Chinese market. That frustration is enough to, for them to just put the game down and not want to spend it. However, cosmetic items, a bigger sword than everybody else's sword, or a sword that is notably more expensive than everyone else's sword, even though it does nothing, button on their phone. And you can walk down and you can just see their person raiding a dungeon by themselves, not playing. <laughs> They're just building stats. You don't build stats by going and killing warpogs in the woods. You just do it by pressing buttons. But they're very happy to do that. Um, however, all of this leads up to the idea of finding a partner. I would say that because I'm one of the people that would love to partner with you. Um, but there are a huge number of benefits. Uh, we'll help you localize. I say we, a partner, will help you localize your game. Uh, suitably, they will uh, help you culturalize your game, uh, translation elements, um, navigating all of those slight differences in the market that I spoke about before, the hundreds of Android channels. For example, a lot of the bigger companies have their own distribution channels, which lets you cut out that 30 to 60% cost, narrowing it down to sometimes under 5% of that cut. Uh, and again, all of this will depend on your negotiation with your potential partner. Um, so, a huge number of benefits, including Recently, there's been a change in Chinese law. Um, I'm not in a position, well, my legal team just told me not to really you know, say anything definitive about it because we're not sure how this is going to turn out. But you need a permit in order to publish a game in China. 
how this is going to work for foreign publishers who don't have a partner, we're yet to see. Uh, this law properly becomes enacted on July the 1st. So in the coming weeks, we'll find out whether it's indeed a legal necessity to have a partner. In the meantime, it's just something that I would recommend doing uh, because it's like walking into a country with no map, no guidebook, no lonely planet, and no dictionary, and no smartphone, and no shoes. Um, <laughs> And everyone speaks Chinese, that is mystifying. Uh, so, so do find a partner. Once you find a partner, remember this partnership, there's going to be give and take on both sides. Don't let them do anything that you think that they shouldn't. At the same time, be ready to be flexible, uh, accommodate some changes that really may need to happen to your game in order to see the right level of success that you're after. And finally, in order to really gain a presence, you have to go all in, you have to commit, you have to uh, it, even if you're a small studio, you can seek Chinese funding in order to get yourself a presence there. Um, put some people on the ground if you possibly can. Uh, 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 read books about it. Get involved. Uh, Chinese history is a very, very long one. Um, cultures and 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 you know the food and everything about China has has grown over a very, very long period of time. Uh, it's all about the long term in China. So in order to really establish yourself there and see success, commit to that long term. Um, so I, I think we're all probably in a little bit of a hurry, but uh, if anyone has any questions at all, I'm going to be sitting around having a beer uh, and enjoying the lovely summer. Um, <laughs> so if anyone has any questions or wants to talk, uh, please do just give me a shout. Thanks very much.